shares those needs. And uh, as we worship, we just pray that you would continue to move in our hearts and move in the hearts of people um, to work for peace. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Would you uh, come? Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm Rose Emmons. I'll be doing, I'll be the worship leader this morning. Um, I just want to praise God for the opportunity to, in the scary time in this world that we're living in, to be able to gather in a safe space and to know that we are supporting one another and praying for those around the world who, who don't have a safe space to gather. So welcome to this this congregation. Welcome to those of you online. We're glad you're with us today, and we pray that this will be a blessing to you. Before service began, I lit our Christ candle that reminds us that Christ, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are with us. They're present. Wherever two or more are gathered, he is here. And we also uh, have our social justice candle. I lit that as well. Our social justice issue for this month is literacy. So we'll be speaking a little bit more about that as well. And I want you to be mindful of that social justice issue and be prayerful in that area. Um, we will go ahead now and stand together. And Michael and Anna will bless us with a uh, praise song. Please stand. sons and daughters, earth revealing heaven's wonders, Spirit come, Spirit come, and what you spoke is now unfolding, and all your children shall be Let your 
again this morning to worship. Uh, my name is Pastor Mary Ivanov. It's a blessing to be with you in worship today, whether you're here in our sanctuary or joining us online. Uh, and uh, as we gather, we are praying for peace in the midst of events this week. We'll share some prayers later in our time of worship, uh, but we trust that God is uh, with us and with those uh, all around the world in this moment. And uh, we trust that God's spirit is working in our lives and in our world, and we will pray uh, and 
uh, offer prayers of intercession during our time of worship today. I want to um, invite those who are joining us online to, to let us know that you're worshiping with us this morning, uh, leaving a comment, leaving a praying hands or a heart or a, a smiley face, something to let us know that uh, you're worshiping with us. We're grateful that you are. Uh, and just a couple of reminders this week. Uh, one is today after our worship service, there are two opportunities. One is for uh, those who are interested in our summer mission trip. Uh, those who are in 8th grade through 12th grade will have a mission trip meeting here at the back of the sanctuary. The other is for those who might be interested in helping to set up for Family Promise. We uh, start our hosting week this week, and so we'll be hosting two families here and uh, ask that if you can help and uh, stay after and help us uh, prepare that space that we need to, to host them well, um, that would be absolutely welcome. So they come tonight, and then they'll be with us through Saturday. Uh, it's uh, almost March, and so uh, the March newsletter was sent out. We have uh, printed copies here. We also have devotionals. If you'd like a printed copy of that, we do uh, offer that devotional every day online as well uh, on our uh, Facebook page, so you can find it there. Uh, we also always invite you to share your prayer requests that we uh, send out to an email prayer chain and uh, for those who pray at home, and also uh, your God moments, those moments when God's grace has been particularly powerful for you this week. We invite you to write them down, send them in. They become a wonderful uh, part of our worship together. And then just reminders for the opportunities this week. Uh, Grief Share meets on Monday nights. We have... Bible study opportunities, uh, Tuesday morning, Tuesday evening, Saturday morning as well, and uh, opportunities this week uh, to serve at Supper House, Tuesday afternoon. I think we have a full crew, but uh, if you're interested, you can call the office. And then our youth group will be serving Family Promise uh, dinner on Wednesday evening. Uh, and Wednesday evening is also, Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, March 2nd the beginning of the season of Lent. And so you're invited to join uh, brothers and sisters in Christ in our larger Methodist family and, and uh, faith community. We'll worship together at Central United Methodist Church downtown Muskegon, 7 o'clock. Uh, it's a really meaningful time to enter the season. Uh, and so would invite you to be part of that. It will be live streamed on Central's Facebook page. And so we'll uh, put that information online and then be available uh, to view after as well. But if you can come and join us, uh, it's a powerful, powerful time to worship. And then next Sunday uh, begins the season of the first Sunday of Lent, and we'll start a new series uh, based on the Psalms. Uh, so we invite you to be, be in worship for that. Um, it is good to be gathered together, and uh, we come today to the end of our series based on To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, the novel that was published in 1960. We've been looking at the intersection of faith and culture during this past month, and today's focus is on defining a mystery. Uh, and maybe a, an easier way to say that is getting answers to the questions we have, and all of us have questions. And in the story, uh, Arthur Radley, whose nickname is Boo, is a source of a lot of mystery, speculation, and many assumptions for uh, Scout and Jem and Dill, the children in the story, for the community. And the kids especially wonder about him and spend a lot of time play acting his life and the stories they've heard. It's interesting though, uh, Boo Radley turns out to be someone who uh, watches over them as a protector and a friend, leaving them small gifts, offering Scout a blanket on a cold night when she didn't even realize it was him, uh, and ultimately saving them from Bob Ewell's evil intentions to hurt them as a way to get back at Atticus for defending Tom Robinson. So uh, we've shown a short clip each week. Today we have another uh, but because of copyright, we're not able to live stream it. So for those of you who are watching online, you have about a minute and a half uh, of a break here. But this is the clip where uh, Scout meets Boo Radley face to face for the first time.
literally tried to watch that clip about 50 times this week, and it doesn't matter how many times I watch it. Uh, it's really a tender moment of recognition and friendship and love when all of Boo's helpful actions are finally realized. Even the brokenness of the world doesn't have the last word, even all with all that's been going on in Scout's community. Uh, this is a moment of hope and grace, and it's a reminder to us of how we experience grace in our lives, too, and sometimes how we experience it in moments that uh, upend our assumptions and our expectations. So I want to invite uh, the kids to come forward this morning. You can come uh, right up here if you want, or stay right where you are. You're good. All right. Got you. You're in a perfect place. All right. So I'm going to stay right here and ask that you uh, say, can you say good morning with me on the count of three? Are you ready? Okay. Nice and loud so that everybody can respond with good morning. Here we go. You ready? One, two, three. Good morning. Good morning. Excellent. All right. So what do I have in my hands? A box. Yes. Do you have any boxes like this at home? Do you? You have a jewelry box, so that might be something that you keep in it, right? Jewelry. Right. What else might you keep in something like this? Maybe special notes or special papers. Yep, sure. Something that you want to keep, something that's special to you. There's a special little box. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you would keep, you could keep crayons or markers in it if you love to draw. There's lots of things you could keep in it. Well, the reason I want to use this box is because sometimes um, if I said, well, guess what's in the box? You need, we probably need some help, right, to figure out what's in the box. And today we're going to read a scripture about um, we're going to read a scripture about a man named Paul. Some of you have heard Paul, of Paul before. Paul was a follower of Jesus, and he went to a city called Athens. And he, when he walked around that city, he could see that people, they, they really wanted to know God, but they weren't very sure, or at least he didn't assume they were very sure about who God was. And so he says, you know, I've seen a lot of these monuments. I've seen a lot of um, the things around your town that, that um, talk about God, but I want you to know who God is. God created everything. What's one of the most beautiful things outside in nature that you love to look at? Tell me. Sunrise and sunset. Good call. Raindrops. You like to hear the raindrops? I like to hear the birds, and I especially like to hear the birds right now because it reminds me that spring is coming. Yes. And even right now, I like to see pavement and grass because the ice is gone, and that's really good news. Yes, so Paul says to the people, you know what, God is the one who created everything, and guess what, God is the one who created you, and you are part of God's family. You're children of God, too. So he takes that opportunity when they're kind of wondering to say, you know what, I want to tell you about who God is. So we can do that, too, right? We can always share about who God is for us. We can talk about you know, God's the one who makes beautiful sunrises and sunsets. God's the one who brings the rain, and the um, we love to listen to the rain. God, who want, God's the one who made all the birds in their beautiful song, and God's the one who made us too, right? And we're we're God's beloved, all of us. So um, we can remember that even when there's we're not sure when we have questions when we're trying to to know, um, or we're trying to help other people know about God. We have ways that we can share that wherever we are, whether we're at home or at church, whether we're at school, wherever we are, okay? So let's pray together this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you love us and that um, by praying, by sharing, by learning together, we can know you more and we can share your love with others. That's something that you always want us to do, whether we talk about you, whether we uh, do things that are kind and good and loving for others. Help us to do that every day and help us to follow you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. Amen. We've come to a point in the service where we like to share God moments with everyone. Um, for those of you who aren't real familiar with what God moments are, uh, it's that time in your life um, and your week and your days where you happen to just really feel the touch of God very close. Uh, you feel his presence. You see something that reminds you how much you're loved. Like this little guy wandering around down here makes me remember how much 
God loves each of us. But my God moment this morning um, comes from this week when I had the opportunity to travel with my husband up north um, for a few days to snowmobile. And we went to Paradise, Michigan. Um, if, if you don't know where that is, it's right on the, the southern part of uh, Whitefish Bay. And it was cold, but it was beautiful. Um, this is also an area that about 10 years ago was ravaged by a forest fire. I don't know how many of you remember back about 10 years ago when the UP had a terrible forest fire that went unchecked for, for many weeks into months and, um, and just, just destroyed much of the forest up there, and there's a lot of forest in the UP. Well, because it's one of my husband's favorite places in the world, we went there after um, that forest fire calmed down just to see what it looked like. Um, and we were just amazed at what we saw. I'd never really been to a place of a forest fire previous to that, but it was what we saw was just devastation, um, destruction, just black earth, nothing living, no birds, no critters, and it was just so sad that this was a place that we had visited so many times, and it was it just looked hopeless, and it was it was a really sad moment for us. Well, this week we on our snowmobile travels we went back to that area again, and it's been like I said about ten years we're, we're recalling. And what was really neat about it was, as we turned the corner where this area was going to lay before us, and it was in its miles and miles and miles. What we saw were occasional tall, dead stumps of trees who had have not recouped, um, and there's very few of those even left. Nothing, um, no trees are alive, um, tall woodland trees. But what we did see were thousands and thousands of evergreens. And then I thought back to myself, back in grade school, in either science or geography, where we learned about forest fires, they talk about the natural cycle of forest fires and how it's, it's a good thing. You know, as bad as it looks, it can be a good thing because the, the fire takes all that's on the ground and it, and it makes it uh, decompose and go into actually nourishing the soil. And the, the fact that the canopy is gone, the sunlight's able to come in. And there are places where the heat actually opens the pine cones and releases seeds and repopulates the forest. Hmm, I wonder who's in charge of all of that. I would have thought that up. So anyway, it was beautiful to just, as far as we could see, there were a little evergreens. Some were little, some were about as tall as me. There were some that were a different kind of evergreen tree that really were very tall. So God had it all figured out, you know, tall, short, short wide, skinny, you know, kind of like all of us. Anyway, that artistry that I saw reminded me of the hope that I can have being a follower of the one who created all of this. And it was evidence that even out of death, and destruction, God in his healing and nurturing hands can create new life and rebirth. What an awesome God we serve. So that was my God moment this week. We will now share uh, some of the other God moments that were sent to us. Remember that you can choose to share your God moments. Uh, send them to office at lakeharborumc.org and we'll have them up the following week. So please take a minute and, and watch some of the God moments that we received this week. And I'll close us in a centering prayer.
pray with me. Good morning, Father. We praise you for the gift of this new day that you've given us. We know that all good things come from you. We know that you are our creator, our savior and redeemer, our comforter and sustainer. Help us to be ever mindful of the beauty you place in our lives every day. And on those days when all we can see are clouds and darkness, you're at work creating beauty that we may not yet be able to see. Help us to always trust in your promises, your amazing grace and love. Quiet us now so we may hear your message that you have for each one of us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come to a time of offering. <clears throat> Remember that as we uh, become United Methodists, we promise to support the church with our prayers, our presence, gifts, our talents, and uh, our witness. So please take this opportunity. Um, there are uh, worship baskets at the back of the church. You can also donate church online. We have noisy offering buckets. Those buckets this month have been designed to support the Dancing with the Local Stars, which supports local food pantries. It's been a wonderful program that we at this church really fully support, and uh, we're grateful for everyone's um, generosity there. So please take this time to offer yourselves. Think of ways you might be of service to yourself, this church, and to God, and enjoy and join us in our offering songs. Would you please stand as able? Speak to me when the side that steals my voice, you understand me. Understand me. You come to me in the valley of unknowns. You understand me. You understand me. You understand me, God. You understand me. So I throw all my cares before you. My doubts and fears don't scare you.
So I throw all my cares before you. My doubts and fears don't scare you. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought. So I stop all negotiations with the God of all creation. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought. So I throw all my cares before you. My doubts and fears don't scare you. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought. So I stop all negotiations with the God of all creation. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought you were.
standing. God, you're the giver of every good gift, and we are grateful for every blessing and for your presence through all of life, in our joys and fears and in our hopes and struggles. We pray for those who seek the consolation of your presence in their lives and pray that you would reveal yourself to them through the gifts we've given, through the lives we live. May all of your children find their true home in you. As we hear your word today, help us, help it to take root in our lives, transform us, strengthen us to be your people, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So our scripture today comes from the book of Acts, in uh, chapter 17, beginning with verse 22. This is an account of Paul's visit to Athens. So Paul stood up in front of the council and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious. As I was going through your city and looking at the things you worship, I found an altar with the words, To an unknown God. You worship this God, but you don't really know him, so I want to tell you about him. This God made the world and everything in it. He is Lord of heaven and earth, and he doesn't live in temples built by human hands. He doesn't need help from anyone. He gives life, breath, and everything else to all people. From one person, God made all the nations who live on earth, and he decided when and where every nation would be. God has done all this so that we will look for him and reach out and find him. He isn't far from any of us, and he gives us the power to live, to move, and to be who we are. We are his children, just as some of your poets have said. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to see a short video this morning. Discover God. In the midst of all stories, stories that shape your life. Discover the faith of a mocking bird. Let's pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I've enjoyed this series, delving into the connection between culture and faith, between stories that change us and shape us, put alongside the good news of Jesus Christ. And one reason that To Kill a Mockingbird is still such a powerful story is because Harper Lee's characters draw us into their story. We become invested. I am highly invested in these characters again after revisiting them in this series. And as I, uh, it was probably evident, I have a hard time getting through the end of, uh, through the scene that we showed today, whether I read it or watch it when Scout meets Boo Radley. The book says it this way, as I gazed at him in wonder, the tension slowly drained from his face. His lips parted into a timid smile, and our neighbor's image blurred with my sudden tears. Hey, boo, I said. Now maybe Scout and Jem and Dill already had an idea that boo was kind, even though it went against their initial expectations and completely flipped the script that had been told about boo for all of his life. Maybe they figured out he was the one who had left the trinkets in the tree or folded Jim's pants over the fence when uh, Jim was trying to, to get out of their yard. Maybe they knew it, but now it's certain. What had been wrapped in mystery, this person who had been unknown 
and the subject of so many questions and assumptions that made him out to be so scary and unpredictable is now better understood, and he is known for who he really is, at least by a few people. But that's where it ends. If you know the rest of the story, the sheriff, Sheriff Tate, and Atticus discuss how to proceed after all that happens with uh, the children and Boo and Bob Ewell, especially because they don't want to bring Boo into the spotlight. It would do more harm than good. And it's Scout who makes the connection to what Atticus had said about mockingbirds. And if you read about mockingbirds, they often mimic the sounds of birds or frogs around them, like blackbirds or orioles or killdeer, jays, hawks, and many others. They go on learning new sounds throughout their lives. But earlier in the book, when Atticus is talking to Jem about practicing with his air rifle, he says that it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. Their neighbor, Miss Maudie, explains it to Scout. Mockingbirds don't do one thing but make music for us to enjoy, she says. They don't do one thing but sing their hearts out for us. And so we have the power of a title and the power of relationships and the stories that we tell about ourselves and tell about each other. We focused on telling our story. That's where we started our unique perspective on God's work in the world. And we focused on Scout that week who tells us the story and the power of a story from her perspective. We talked about God's call to be saints, using our witness to point, God, to, point to God in every circumstance and know that God is with us even in the midst of really difficult moments. Atticus helps us understand integrity, truly living our faith even when it seems that what is right won't prevail, and holding faith even when it doesn't. We spent time talking about other people's stories, some that are shared and some that are never heard because of the assumptions we make and the biases and prejudices we carry. Tom Robinson's struggle to find justice is painful and still reminds us of the need for justice that is elusive for some. And Boo's story also reminds us that assumptions can be unfair and destructive. They can even become more powerful than truth. But when we know the truth, it can transform us and our relationships. So our faith in God brings an element of mystery too. It's not that we can't know God, but there's a sense of mystery and awe and wonder when we consider who God is, what God is like, and how God works in the world. It's part of letting God be God and understanding that we are not God, though I have lots of suggestions for how things should go. We can't understand it all. It can be a great inv invitation for us to live in that mystery, but it can also be scary to live with, with mystery. Paul unpacks it in many ways. Uh, first for the church, the, the one that I'll share this morning is for the church in Corinth, the different passage than what, what I read. But he unpacks the, especially the mystery of death and resurrection, of sin and forgiveness, of transformation, seeking to help them understand the power and mystery of God. And so this is what it says in 1 Corinthians 15. My friends, I want you to know that our bodies of flesh and blood will decay. This means that, we, that they cannot share in God's kingdom, which lasts forever. I will explain a mystery to you. Not every one of us will die, but we will all be changed. The bodies we now have are weak and can die, but they will be changed into bodies that are eternal. Then the scriptures will come true. Death has lost the battle. Where is the victory? Where is its sting? Sin is what gives death its sting, and the law is the power behind sin. But thank God for letting our Lord Jesus Christ give us the victory. My, my dear friends, stand firm and don't be shaken. Always keep busy working for the Lord. You know that everything you do for him is worthwhile. So even Paul tries to explain the mystery, and it's still something we live into. Paul's encounter with the people in Athens, too, from the book of Acts, is a moment of defining a mystery enough so that we can experience transformation. You notice that when Paul comes into the city, he looks around and he sees and affirms the faith that they even claim, even if it's a little bit. People worshipped gods, but God was more of an idea for them. We can know about God, but God seeks to be known intimately, just as God knows us intimately. God wants a relationship with us, and so much, so much so that God comes fully revealed in Jesus to be with us, to walk in our shoes, to show us the power of love and hope. And so that encounter that Paul has in Athens is a powerful one. 
we may know people and we may be those people who are seeking something or someone who seems unknown or unknowable. Maybe you feel like one of those people in Athens. There's something or someone, I'm not quite sure, but there's something there. Even if we claim a relationship with God through Christ, we are always learning and growing in God. It is never done. St. Anselm, a monk who lived in the 11th century, called it faith-seeking understanding, and it's a great phrase. Our faith seeks understanding. It's always active, alive, and moving. We've never arrived at the place where we understand God completely, and we'd probably uh, struggle to describe God in full to someone else, though we have those moments of grace that offer a powerful witness. That's part of why we share those moments with each other. It's part of the mystery that we live in, but we also take comfort in it. So for all of us, as we're thinking about the mystery of God, the majesty of God, here's a question. In what ways do you desire to know more about God? And you'll see that projected as well. In what ways do you desire to know more about God? We all have questions, probably more questions as we grow in our relationship with God. At least that's true for me. It seems that uh, once I figure one thing out, there's just more to try to understand even this week as we've witnessed the news and the struggles, the invasion of Ukraine, perhaps we've asked questions about why. Why is this happening? Why are things going this way? Maybe we've prayed to God to intervene, and we'll pray today for peace. But those questions are still there. We want to know more about how God works in the world about our part in God's working in the world. And so we come to the end of this series when we focused on the power of stories. Today we come and focus on mystery as we prepare for Lent, which begins this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. So today is the last Sunday of the season of Epiphany, that season when we celebrate God coming for the world. And usually it's the day when we celebrate the transfiguration of Jesus. Maybe you remember the story from the Gospels. Jesus leads a small group of disciples up a mountain. His appearance changes before them. A voice tells the disciples to listen, and they want to stay up on that mountain with him. They do not want to come down because it is a good place to be. It was a spectacular view and an amazing moment of glory, one of those thin places where heaven and earth come together, and it's a moment when Jesus' identity is confirmed for the disciples again. But it's right after that, right after that moment that Jesus begins to move toward Jerusalem, toward the cross, as controversy grows around him. That moment that we saw in the clip that if you've read the book, you know that moment of recognition for Scout and Boo is a moment of grace and truth, of deeper understanding, a recognition, some peeling away of the mystery that has surrounded that relationship. And we need that today as we gather to worship God who is holy, God who is faithful, as we pray for people who are in the midst of an invasion and conflict, as we remember that we need God's grace to guide us even as we embrace the mystery of God and God's work in our lives. And so it's a good day. It's always a good day, but today is a good day to talk about grace. How do you describe God's grace. How do you describe it? In our Methodist tradition, grace is a word with really deep meaning, and we're not alone in that, but it's not so simple to define and not always easy to describe. But I appreciate that we have a sense of how grace moves in our lives, how God moves in our lives, because it reminds me that grace really is a gift. That's what it is. So in our Methodist tradition, here's how we might describe it. And these words might be familiar or not to you, but they're important ones. Grace, kind of this threefold movement of grace. Provenient grace, grace that goes before us and prepares us to accept God's love. God's love is there from the beginning, preparing our hearts to love God. And in the story, there's this powerful connection as we think about Boo and everything that Boo has done, leaving the trinkets in the tree and helping the children kind of in the background. Those acts of kindness and generosity are an example of how grace works toward us. Grace, grace works in our lives to open us and open our hearts to God. And so it begs the question, 
Maybe you're not wondering about Boo Radley in your life. Maybe your situation is different. But how many times is God reaching out to us in grace every day without us noticing, without us paying close attention, without us claiming those gifts of grace? And maybe this season of Lent can be a time to focus more intently and more intentionally on how God's grace is at work in our lives. So provenient grace, grace that goes before us. And then there's justifying grace, grace that works for us and makes us right with God, restores us. And for some, it's that moment of accepting Christ, accepting Christ as our Savior. That's how some might describe it. But it's grace that makes us right with God. And in order to understand justifying grace and to really receive it, we have to understand why we need it. And so that means we have to acknowledge and be convicted of our sin, the ways that we miss the mark when it comes to God's will for us. Let's confess it. We do things we shouldn't do, and we don't do things that we should do. And all of that grieves God's heart. We can't save ourselves, and grace means that in spite of our sin, we are made one with God through grace because of Jesus' saving love, that agape love, sacrificial love. Our broken relationship is restored by God's grace. So sometimes I think we get stuck at that point. We say, oh, we're good. We have a relationship with God. But that's not the end because there's another part of how grace moves in our lives, sanctifying grace, grace that works within us. There's more work that God does in us. And so sanctifying grace works within us and helps us to grow in holiness of heart and life. And living in God's grace means that we receive a free gift, but it's not a free pass. Grace is a free gift, but it's not a free pass. Grace moves us to respond and invites us to respond in love and grace to others. And sometimes that's the hardest work. Isn't it difficult sometimes to respond in love and grace to others? I love God, but loving others is sometimes a chore. I'm just going to be honest. That's the work of sanctifying grace in us. And sometimes the struggle. So we are res- we in- we're invited to respond in love and grace to others, to be open to God's work in us. And it's, more in- it's more than knowing about God's story. It's seeing ourselves as a part of the story that God is writing even now. We're a part of God's kingdom work even as we witness both the glory and the brokenness of the world. We don't have to know it all to do God's work. No one ever has and no one ever will. But we can claim the mystery even as we are God's people, beloved, called, and sent to do the hard work of loving in the name of Jesus. So I invite us to pray this morning. And uh, as we join with so many around the world, we are praying uh, specifically for the situation in in Ukraine. So I would invite you to be in a a posture of prayer that's comfortable for you. If it's comfortable for you to open your hands uh, as just a way to be, um, to open our lives to the, the power of the Spirit and to offer our hearts this morning in prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, we give you thanks for the ways that we have experienced your love and grace in our midst, for the ways that we know who you are, one who loves us faithfully, one who brings justice with peace, one who desires wholeness and salvation for all your children. And even as we pray with such certainty, we also stand in the mystery and the awe and wonder of who you are. And today, O God, as we gather here in our sanctuary, for those who gather with us virtually, for those who are gathering all over the world, we join with many as we intercede. We ask and intercede for peace in Ukraine, for for a withdrawal of Russian troops. We pray for the people in Ukraine and Russia as they feel the threat of war and disunity. We pray for protection and reconciliation and peace. For those who are sheltering, for those who are protesting, for those who are afraid, hold them close. For those who lead and have power as heads of states, as diplomats, 
We pray that they would choose life for all people, the abundant life that you desire for us. We pray for those who would choose war, that their hard hearts would be molded to your will and way, that they would have a change of mind and seek de-escalation and dialogue. And we pray for a time where swords are turned into tools for gardening and a time when no one knows war anymore. We pray for all of us in the midst of all that we see and experience We pray that we would have the wisdom and courage of Christ. And we pray especially for people of faith, for Christians and people of other faith traditions who are living in the midst of a time of conflict, for pastors and leaders, for churches and houses of worship that are providing shelter and keeping vigil to serve others for leaders who are leading in this difficult moment, and we especially lift up our bishops and our pastors and the United Methodist Church around the world, for Bishop Alstead, for Bishop Kige in Eurasia, who oversees churches in both Ukraine and Russia, for the United Methodist Committee on Relief and others who are seeking to offer aid, and for our unity in Christ, that it would be a source of care and compassion for the witness that we offer to bring strength and hope God, hear our prayers today for peace. We know the cost of war and violence. Some of us know it very, very intimately. We also know the message of Christ is one of reconciliation. Hear all the prayers that we offer. And as we approach this holy season of Lent, when we focus more intently on prayer and fasting and searching our own souls, let our prayers continue for peace in our hearts, in our homes, in our community, and in our world. Help us pursue what makes for peace. Even if it seems naive in the face of what we see, remind us that peacemakers and bridge builders are needed more than ever. For peace, we pray today. And I offer these words from Carolyn Winfrey Gillette. We pray for peace, O God, of love and justice, as once again we face a time of war. The meek and humble try amid the crisis to love and build, to nurture and restore. May leaders hear the truth the prophets teach us, that gifts of peace are well worth struggling for. We pray for peace, O Christ, who calmed the waters, who stilled the storm, who stilled disciples' fear. You spoke with love and with amazing power. Be with us now when trouble is so near. May leaders see the miracle you offer, that words and deeds can calm the nation's fear. We pray for peace. O Spirit, here among us, your love emboldens, judges, and restrains. Take any hate and acts of impulse from us. Make leaders wise amid competing claims. May we seek peace, O God of love and justice. May love and mercy be our highest aims. Lord, hear our prayer, and hear the prayer that we pray together in the Spirit of Christ. Loving Creator, We honor you and we honor all that you have made. Renew the whole world in the image of your love. Give us what we need for today and give us a hunger to see the whole world fed. Strengthen us for what lies ahead. Forgive our sin, bring healing from the hurts of the past and help us to forgive those who have hurt us. Give us courage to follow your call in this moment and always. For your love is the only power, the only home, the only honor we need in this world, in the world to come. Amen. Friends, would you stand as you are able and will sing together as we're sent out into the world.
May the light of God shine in our world. May we continue to pray for peace. And may we know, may we know the peace, the deep down peace of God that sustains us. Go in peace and make peace. Amen. Amen.